Recently, our nation was shocked by the horrific tragedy that occurred in Newtown, Connecticut. In response, there has been a renewed commitment to creating school communities that are safe and ensuring that our students receive all they need to learn and grow. As a member of the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors, I was proud to join Congresswoman Jackie Speer, Sheriff Greg Monks, the County Office of Education, and the County Office of Behavioral Health and Recovery Services in gathering local leaders and service providers for a summit entitled Beyond Newtown, How to Ensure Safe Schools and Communities. In one room, we brought together school district officials, police chiefs, mayors, city council members, public health and mental health service professionals. And at the end of the conference, three task forces were created to take a close look at San Mateo County's efforts to prevent tragedies in our communities. The three task force address standardization of protocols, mental health services, and information sharing between agencies. What you're about to see is a panel discussion on the mental health services provided by San Mateo County and our school districts, moderated by Ann Campbell, San Mateo County's Superintendent of Schools. The discussion centers around identifying gaps in the services that are provided to students with mental health issues. Thank you for watching. Our next panel is going to focus on mental health supports for schools and communities. And this is a particularly important area for us to focus on because it provides us with opportunities for being proactive rather than reactive as we think about school safety and creating positive school climates. I was asked to say a few words today about the San Mateo County Office of Education and the different initiatives that we have underway to foster positive school climate on every single campus in San Mateo County. In our work, we've been particularly focused on something that we call Respect 24-7, that actually at this week is celebrating its second birthday. And Respect 24-7 started as an anti-bullying initiative. We've been bringing together uh, educators from throughout the county over the last two years to really focus on how do we create positive school climate so that bullying um, declines on those uh, campuses. And we have Dr. Leslie Martin here today from Taylor Middle School in Millbrae who has a really remarkable anti-bullying program going on that she will be sharing with you. Um, but we found over the years, as we've been working on Respect 24-7, that anti-bullying efforts are very important, but there are many other aspects to creating positive school climate, and we've certainly learned about many of those today with regard to mental health, and we'll delve into that more deeply. One of the areas that we've been focusing on over the past year is looking at our middle and high schools in our county at our suspension and expulsion rates and trying to really drill down into the data at the school site level with school staff members to see what the data shows us as far as trends are concerned and then to bring together schools uh, and educators who've had a great deal of success in creating positive school climates <coughs> and where suspension and expulsion rates have declined. Um, certainly, as we look at the Ravenswood City School District with their positive behavioral in intervention and support and the Sequoia Union High School District, those are two areas in our county where there's incredibly positive work going in that realm as well. Um, we've also learned, as somebody mentioned in the question period a little while ago, um, that the earlier interventions happen, the better off everybody is. And certainly at the county office, we're um, very actively involved at the elementary school level and at the pre-K level as well in terms of educating parents and educators as far as signs to look for uh, in, as kids need help. But most importantly, what I would say we've learned from our Respect 24-7 work over the last two years is that schools can't do this work in isolation. And the very factor that we have so many different um, communities represented here today, so many different agencies and organizations, mm -hmm. gives us great hope that as we move forward together, coming out of our Beyond Newtown Summit today, that we will be able to make a real difference uh, in the lives of all of the kids on all of the campuses in San Mateo County. So as we move into our panel discussion, I'd like to introduce our panel to you. You've already met Dr. Joshi. Um, we also have Mr. Stephen Kaplan, who's the Director of Behavioral Health and Recovery Services for the County of San Mateo. Uh, Ms. J. Africa is the Health Equity Manager for Behavioral Health and Recovery Services for the County. Mr. Jeff Steinberg is the Executive Director of Sojourn to the Past, a trip I highly recommend. And Dr. Leslie Martin is the principal of Taylor Middle School in the Millbrae Elementary School District. Our panel is going to take a little bit of a different approach than the previous panel. They each are going to have 10 minutes to share with you their thoughts on three different topics. First, they'll highlight how the work that they do from their particular perspective 
offers insight into what they know about what works to better ensure resiliency in our young people. Then they'll look at some of the barriers that are out there um, that still remain in place that make it very difficult for us to do this work. And then finally, they'll conclude with an explanation of what they see as the next steps from their unique perspective that need to be taken or that we all need to take together to ensure a better system for serving the mental health needs of our youth and their families. And then if we have a little bit of time at the end, we hope to squeeze in questions as well. Uh, so uh, we'd like to go in this order. We'll go first with uh, Steve Kaplan, then with Jay Africa, Jeff Steinberg, Leslie Martin, and then we'll conclude uh, with Dr. Joshi as well. So Steve, you're on. Thank you. Um, can you cue up that um, PowerPoint somehow? While that's um, getting queued up, um, just a brief uh, uh, bit of information. The San Mateo Behavioral Health and Recovery Services, we um, have responsibility for providing services in the public sector to children, families, and adults. Um, and we've had a long history of working with the schools, um, particularly in providing services to seriously emotional, emotionally disturbed children who are identified as part of special education. And also, we've been involved in other prevention and early intervention efforts. Uh, since the Newtown uh, tragedy, uh, we've had direction from our board and county manager to redouble our efforts in working with our school partners through the County Office of Education, probation, and child welfare and to try to identify where the gaps are in providing mental health services to our student population. And we uh, have some ideas that we're uh, developing that we'll be sharing with our board and county manager over the next several months. Uh, Dr. Newman talked about um, those examples that she studied as a low frequency uh, behavior. And I want to um, change gears a bit and talk about the overall mental health uh, picture of students in San Mateo County and then some ideas about uh, what, what we can do to address that. Because I think by focusing on the larger population of the mental health needs of the students in our community, we have an opportunity to intervene early and prevent many, many unforeseen and unwanted consequences, not just uh, prevention of violence, but other uh, areas in people's lives. So some information from uh, the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, um, and Dr. Joshi referenced this, but about 21% of children between 19 and 17 uh, will have a diagnosable mental health or addictive disorder that causes some level of impairment. And half of those mental health disorders will uh, achieve onset uh, by the age of 14. However, in, only, in any given year, only 20% of those children will actually be identified uh, with a diagnosis. Next slide. In San Mateo County, there's about 88,000 public school students. I tried to do the math, so some of you educators may quarrel with that a little bit. Um, so if we take that 21% as a, as a number, um, just over 12,000 students currently in our schools would have a diagnosable mental health condition, but because only 20% get identified, anywhere between eight and 10,000 of those kids right now are on our campuses um, not being identified with a mental health condition. Next slide. <coughs> There's um, a survey called the California Healthy Kids Survey. It's a self-report survey. So these are th some things that uh, kids in our schools are telling us about what's happening in their lives that I think have a direct relationship to the things that we've been talking about and certainly to the things that Dr. Joshi talked about in terms of what's happening in the community in which kids live. So this survey was conducted with 7th, 9th, and 11th graders. Um, this is San Mateo specific uh, information. So they were asked how many uh, have, within the last 12 months, been the subject of any verbal harassment at school? And 13,000 kids report that they had been as a result of rumors or lies that were spread in, around the campus. 16,640 were the subject of harassment based upon sexual jokes or comments. And over 14,000 were uh, harassed because of the way they looked or the way they talked. 
Additional reasons for harassment on property, on the school property, had to do with their race and ethnicity, national origin, sexual orientation, and whether they were perceived to have a physical or mental disability. Uh, specifically to the issue of uh, depression and isolation, um, almost 30% of your high school, middle school, and elementary school students uh, feel some level of sadness and hopelessness in the last 12 months. That equates to over 15,000 students on campuses feeling that way at the present time. So we know, in addition to what Dr. Newman talked about, about the potential for uh, those kinds of uh, violent acts, there's other consequences for not having the resources to effectively identify and intervene in the lives of the people, the young people that I just mentioned. Uh, certainly, untreated mental illness can certainly lead to a much more severe and difficult to treat illness as the person matures uh, in their age and their illness. Uh, we know that suicide is the third leading cause of death in young people. Over 90% of them have some diagnosable mental health disorder. And Dr. Joshi mentioned this uh, I've been, uh, in his slide, but 50% of students who are age 14 and older living with a mental illness drop out of high school. The highest dropout rate of any disability group. This is kind of a hidden uh, fact that I don't think many of us are really in tune to. We also know um, we've been doing a lot of work locally in our jail system, in our criminal justice system to try to work with people uh, successfully when they uh, re-enter the community. And uh, in that work, we're really uh, aware of the high, high prevalence of untreated mental health and addictive disorders among that population, and the high degree of trauma and uh, abuse also in that population, also typically unreported and untreated. And then there was a study by the National Institute of Mental Health largest ever taken that between 65% of the boys and 75% of the girls who are in juvenile detention have some sort of mental illness. Um, kind of speaks to what uh, Chief Manheimer was talking about earlier, about the ability to really identify young people as they're coming into contact with the criminal justice system as early as possible so that that early identification and intervention can take place. We also, on the positive side, know that treatment works for this population, so the importance of identifying them is really, really critical. Uh, we, by intervening early, we really can minimize some of the uh, untreated consequences that I mentioned. There are effective treatments, they are research and evidence-based. One of the important things that happens when young people uh, experience addictive disorders or start to engage with a mental illness is it really critically affects their developmental process. And again, the earlier we can intervene, the better. Uh, there's some, been some talk about how we engage uh, a broader spectrum of adults, and Jay will talk a little bit about this, but there is research around things like mental health first aid, where a group of trusted adults can be trained to identify and intervene effectively and refer effectively for young people uh, so we can get them the help they need. Next slide. I want to talk uh, just briefly about stigma. In the aftermath of some of these events like Newtown, um, things run rampant around mental illness and the mentally ill and that mentally ill people are dangerous and we ought to be careful about them. Uh, when in fact, um, if you're mentally ill, you're far more likely to be the victim of the crime than a perpetrator of a crime. And when the, we get this big public outroar, it has a, an a impact that is the reverse of what we want. It sends people underground. It sends families underground who might be concerned about their loved one because of the, the shame and guilt that the community conveys to them as opposed to acceptance and caring so that the person can come forward. So as we have these conversations, I want to just be mindful of how stigma plays out in the dynamics of identification and intervention with people who are struggling with mental illness. So some steps to take. We can certainly strengthen the relationship 
between our, our organization and schools and probation, the child welfare system and law enforcement. I think we have good things in place. I think we do share information when we can. We're, we, as uh, clinical professionals, are bound to report under Tarasoff when we feel like uh, there's an imminent risk through um, an intervention or through a clinical contact we've had. We can also educate our youth and school staff and parents on the signs of distress and emotional concerns and to normalize seeking help. I think some of the things Dr. Yoshi, Joshi talked about was kind of how do we create a culture on campus to normalize. And we can also ensure that uh, school personnel and parents know not where to get help, but how to get help. And we can certainly do a better job with that. So I'll just close with those comments. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. Um, there are a couple of things that I am sort of thinking about um, in terms of what Dr. Newman and Dr. Yoshito spoke about is really creating a community that we look out for each other, that we care for each other, and that we support each other um, as educators, law enforcement, mental health professionals, our peers, our parents. The other one is the significance of early identification and strategies to prevent sort of the severity of mental illness or problems. And the last one that really sort of resonates with me is really understanding sort of the cultural nuances. And we, when I talk about cultural nuances, it's not just the racial, ethnic, and language. It talks about generational differences. Media, for example, that most of uh, the young people now are very media savvy and technology savvy that some of the parents that we work with, for example, have no idea of the, the extent of information that they're available to them. We are very lucky at the Behavioral Health and Recovery Services that we have not only looked at treatment, but really looking at prevention uh, as a way to address the issues that are, beset, beset, that are present in our community. Um, one of the things that I want to, two of the things that I want to highlight is our parent classes, our parent project. Um, we have now, since 2010, uh, implemented and sponsored uh, parenting classes around San Mateo County to teach parents uh, not only to be better parents, but to really pro create a network for them so that they can support each other. So the parent classes, for example, are 12 to 16 weeks, where we bring in parents um, to 12, weeks, six, uh, 12 to 16 weeks, three hours, to come together to learn information on communication, disciplining their children, the importance of talking to their kids, the importance of knowing what their kids are doing, what they're learning at school. But in addition to that, aside from the skill based in the information, they get to create a community of parents that they can call on each other when they're, having, they're facing many issues. Now this is really important because we know that many of our communities have the stigma and the distrust to seeking services from public and private institutions. So by allowing them the opportunity to come together and address these issues among themselves, in addition to telling them that there are many providers that can help you, including schools, that they create sort of a, a, sort of a, a capacity for, for them to feel really confident to address the issues that they, they see with their children. The other thing that we do also is to teach them to look out for warning signs that most of the parents have no idea what to look out for. And so when their children, for example, are not going out of their rooms, when their children are starting to uh, text more and not talk to them, when their children are, not, uh, are going out and sneaking out, um, doing poorly in school, we tell them that these might be, there might, these might be signs that some, something is going wrong, that they need a little bit more communication or intervention. So the parent classes are a wonderful way to build community um, among the parents. It, we have also done a lot of cultural adaptations. We have facilitators that speak the language that are part of their community. Most of them are not professional, but they themselves have struggled with parenting issues. We provide childcare, we provide food. We've actually done a lot of partnering with the schools. Currently, we have two schools, uh, Cesar Chavez in East Palo Alto, uh, Menlo Atherton High School that we are doing these schools. And we've also done at Los Cerritos um, Elementary School, I believe, in South San Francisco. So we feel that that really is sort of important in teaching parents the skills uh, to become better parents, but also to uh, learn the warning signs, uh, to know if there is something going on in their family. 
The other one, and Dr. Yoshi had spoken about it, is really the psychological first aid. So I, I'm not quite sure if many of you know that there is a 12-hour national curriculum that is being used, actually international curriculum that is being used, uh, that was developed in um, actually Australia a few years ago called the Mental Health First Aid that is being sponsored by the National Council and a few other agencies in the West and the East Coast to teach people how to look at or how to help people who are developing some sort of emotional crisis. Now these, uh, this curriculum uh, really helps not only uh, learn the symptoms and the signs, but more importantly, to teach people how to help someone, some, someone who is developing the cri crisis. And we've seen pe parents talk about so sig the significance of having these intervention so that they can help each other, their family members that are in distress. Um, in a few months, we will be launching our mental health first aid youth program. This is specifically targeted for folks who are working more in the school system and working with youth. And we have been able to see, and I didn't bring the data, um, and I can provide it uh, for you, that we've really seen people that have, because they have taken these classes, feel more confident in addressing those issues and looking for resources to help other people, their family members, for example. Um, I don't know how many of us, unless you're in the, prof in mental, in the mental health field, have ever had a class or a training on how to help somebody who's developing an emotional distress. We think it's human nature and natural, but many people, because of cultural experiences, because of cultural beliefs, really have maybe not so good helping capabilities, I'll just say that. Um, for example, we have a parent that, who took the class and said, um, you know, I didn't realize that we can ask our children or a family member if they've thought about suicide, because we, in our culture, if we bring up the issue of suicide, we think that we're adding it to their mind, that they're going to do it more because we're asking that question. And research is saying, actually, that if you do it in a more culturally sensitive, congruent way, you actually open more doors in really having a conversation about, uh, about these issues. So behavioral health is sort of really very fortunate that um, using these two uh, uh, methods to actually engage the community, engage our family, um, engage folks who are not the usual, I was gonna say suspects, but are, are the folks that are involved in, our, um, in, in, in the work that we do, chambers of commerce, our faith-based community, which are really, really key in the work that we do, and create, in my opinion, um, a culture of trust. Um, so I, one of the things that we see um, in our communities, there's a huge distrust, and we are telling our, our parents, the people that we work with, that you, we need to learn to trust each other, and it takes time, but we are looking out for each other as a community. Um, let me, one of the things that we saw, I'm gonna go back to our parent class, because I think um, it's sort of an important cultural nuance, is one of our parents who was Pacific Islander, who have never taken a parenting class in her life said, you know, in the Pacific Islander culture, you know, we do things a lot differently. They, they said that although they're very ashamed of it, they, get, they grew up with sort of a very physically, um, there was a lot of physical violence in their community, um, in their family too. And when they came to this country, in addition to the stress of adapting to the US way of life, of having two jobs, um, that, you know, the, when she was trying to discipline her child, her usual, way of doing it was sort of to spank and physically hurt her child. Her daughter said, I'm gonna call 911. And she's like, and she said that she froze and like, she had no idea what 911 was. And then she realized that 911 was, they were teaching that in school as a way that when your parents or somebody is sort of taking advantage of you or hurting you, that you call this number and help will come. And she had no idea what that was. And at a certain point, that became sort of a way, that was sort of a threat to her that every time that she wanted to talk to her child or discipline her child, her daughter would say 911. And that really closed the communication. And so I think it's really important that um, through some of our processes that we work together because we cannot do this work alone. Uh, we need to be involved in sort of each other's lives in a way that really is culturally uh, family sensitive and culturally congruent. 
Um, Steve had mentioned to me that, you know, children get a lot of resources. They have school counselors, they have principals, they have folks, school resource officers. But when they come to their homes, when they go back to their homes, they tend to be dysfunctional, they tend to have a lot of challenges. It's actually also the parents that need the help and the resources to do this work because they spend some time in the school, they get the resources, but they still go to homes that might be full of um, you know, chaos and, and dysfunction and challenges. So um, I think we really need to work together. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jeff Steinberg and I am the founder of an organization called Sojourn to the Past. And before I begin, I wanna congratulate Congresswoman Spear for being a hero to so many of us in here. Uh, a hero to me is somebody who has vision and is saying we are not gonna be complacent, we are gonna be the social changers. So I wanna thank her and her staff for putting this together. Thank you very much. <laughs> the organi organization I started is a nonprofit and we're known for taking high school students and college students and middle school students and look at our morals through the lens of history through the lens of the civil rights movement, for instance. And we certainly do that. We've done in 13 years, uh, quick background. I was a history teacher at Cappuccino High School for many years. I went to Cappuccino as a student. I'm a product of this system. I grew up in Millbrae. I live in Millbrae now. And when I started this organization, I was troubled because I saw high school students don't really get it. And I mean it. They don't really understand nonviolence, real courage, um, forgiveness, compassion. And I thought, who better shares that than people in the civil rights movement? So I formed this organization and 13 years later, we've done 70 trips and taken 6,900 high school, college students into the deep south. Each year I do about 250 presentations. So I'm in every school that's in this room presenting lessons about the civil rights movement. And we speak to about 30,000 students a year. But I come here troubled today. And I'm troubled because I'm angry. I'm angry at what's in the news, I'm saddened. But I argue anger turned positive is social justice. Anger turned negative is destructive. And we are great in this country at teaching violence. I think we're experts at teaching violence. Example, we have a department of war in this country, but we don't have a department of peace. Something's amiss to me. Um, found a study from the University of Michigan a few years ago where the average, by the time a child is 18, they've seen over 200,000 violent acts on television, 200,000. And they've seen 16,000 murders. Well, I'm troubled by that. And I ask myself, what do we do about it? So some of our challenges we do is, we want to reframe. You see principles of nonviolence up on the screen. I'm going to get to it in a moment. But we want to free, reframe how we look at things and change the paradigm. I want to start with this. We use the term bullying in our schools. Some people have said harassment up here. I go one step further. I call it American terrorism, what's happening in some of our schools. Some of our young people are being terrorized daily. And I'm concerned about the populace of how we stop that. How do we help our most marginalized of students? Um, in doing that, I'm tired of kids glorifying violence. I'm tired of young people wearing rest in peace shirts. I don't know if you've seen them, the RIP shirts or dog tags. That's not okay. So I, I'm arguing we change the language. And I, like I say, American terrorism, it's fine to use the word terrorism over there. Why aren't we using it in what goes on in our schools? And I, like I said, I'm in every school uh, doing presentations. I start with this, language is violence. Language is violence. And it follows a pattern to me, because once we diminish people and make them less than, whether it's racist, sexist, homophobic, people with disabilities, once they're less than human, they're not my equal, and I can do whatever I want to them leading to a violent outcome oftentimes. And kids use language um, in their everyday language. I don't just mean the N-word. Language that degrades any person of color. White people, again, gay people. And that's acceptable. Comments like, that's so gay. Well, at what point did we stop and say, we have to check ourselves as adults, 
and we have to make our young people and change the paradigm, which I'm gonna get to in a moment. We call when we don't speak, when we, we need to teach our young people that speaking out is not ratting or thinking. It is, it is what I call, we need to teach our kids not to be silent witnesses, that we all have an obligation to do our part, to make sure people's stories are heard. And certainly we ask people, what would you put yourself on the line for? Where might you show courage? Now, you see the principles of nonviolence here. These are not mine, these come from Dr. King and Jim Lawson and Gandhi. People think if you're nonviolent, you're a wimp. Someone gets in your face, what have we been taught? You get in theirs. Someone hits you, you hit him back. Well, I dare anyone here to call Dr. King or Gandhi a wimp. Look at number one, nonviolence is a way of life for courageous people. Change the paradigm and the language. You're a person of courage if you could do this. Number two, nonviolence seeks to win friendship and understanding. Well, can you imagine if that is the theory, we want friendship and understanding in our schools? We wanna reach out to the kids who are being marginalized? We wanna invite them into our groups? I argue, things begin to change. We have one of our speakers, who's one of the Little Rock Nine, her name's Elizabeth Eckford, who come out, tried to commit suicide. There were two white kids in 1957, two out of a school of 1800, who reached out to her. That stopped her from succeeding. And you know what she tells our young people who she meets? She says, when you reach out to someone, even if you give them a smile and you don't know them, when you reach out even smile at somebody, you might be somebody's hope someday. And when you reach out to someone, you may, be, you may help someone live another day. That's real. So our argument here is, these principles of nonviolence, which don't attack people, they attack injustice. Our argument is, and I think this is something that can actually be done. People are looking for solutions. I think this is one. I met with Assemblyman Kevin Mullen, and I asked him, how hard would it be to get these in every school in our county? There's 10,000 schools, kindergarten through high school. How hard would it get these principles of nonviolence to be institutionalized. Because if you look at the first two, it's a form of peer mediation. It's a form of anti-bullying. And if it starts in kindergarten and works its way up every school, then I think there's something to point to, something to say. This is what we want to aspire to. You've all heard the term uh, emergency medical technicians. I argue we want in our schools ENTs, emergency nonviolent technicians. And I argue a form of peer mediation. This was given to me by one of the, somebody in the civil rights community who said, Jeff, watch what will happen. If these were up in every school, climate in schools will change. Kindergarten through high school, I know it, wor it would work. Thank you all for your time. Hi, I'm, I'm Leslie Martin. I'm the principal at Taylor Middle School. And Taylor is a high achieving, ethnically diverse middle school in Millbrae. We just received the California Distinguished Award for 2013. So, <laughs> so even though bullying and harassment is rampant online, it seems hidden and subtle at our school. It's per, it, the perceived benign ex incidences are under the guise of, oh, Dr. Martin, I was just fooling around. But they do hurt and they do cause lasting pain. So we thought at our school that the awareness of this issue was extremely important. But the best way to make the change was for everyone to be on board. Everyone including the students, the staff, and the parents. So through a collaboration with the San Mateo County Office of Ed, very, uh, Donors Choose, various nonprofit groups, including Star Vista, um, we had a field trip for 900 kids. <laughs> and to see the movie Bully, and in that process, was truly extraordinary. We had the Bully Project in New York send a film crew to document the field trip, but also the follow-up. So um, I would like you to see this film. It's a, it's a six minute piece that we're gonna show right now. And uh, it currently is on DVD and it is in the extra sec uh, section and it has been distributed nationwide.
assistant principal here at Taylor Middle School in Millbrae, California. Now, bullying is a problem at every middle school, and in our middle school, of course. The guys around here, they play rough, you know, and uh, I didn't really get used to that when I was first year. I don't know too much about the girls, because they have their own little thing going on. They usually use the social networks and things like that. They would um, bully me because I was a little chubby, and they said, you're a normal, you, you can't run as fast as me, or you can't do good as me. So you are in the I'm Richmond going. Drive. Yep. Nancy is in the front. Yep. I'm on the, side. the principal, Dr. Martin, and I had a long discussion and found out about an opportunity to take all 900 of our students and all our teachers to see the balloon movie, even the bus drivers. It was decided by staff and everybody else that we would prepare our students for the five stories in the movie. It was an intense movie because no, nobody had a dry eye, nobody. Uh, I already felt sympathy for everybody in that whole film. <laughs> felt like there wasn't really people who understood me, but then when I saw that there was like actually people who had a lot, like a lot worse, and they um, they kind of had the same problems as me, it made me feel more connected, mm -hmm. and it made me feel like I do fit in somewhere because there are people having the same problems. I think you guys might be really good friends at some time. We were, and things aren't holding. I have been bullied before. I felt that same feeling. Like Alex said, you know, I wanted to be the bully. I wanted to see how it felt. I wanted that power. I wanted that. I did do it for a little bit. I got in trouble, things like that. Some people don't really understand the damage they're causing to other students. They have really gone a mile in their shoes. two different periods debriefing the five stories in addition to making a pledge about what they would do to be upstanders. First they came to the trade unionists, and I wasn't a trade unionist, so I didn't say anything. And then they came for the Catholics, and I wasn't Catholic. And when they came for me, there was no one left to speak of. That's the most extreme case of bullying, isn't it? Right? The Holocaust. But how many people were bystanders and watched it? We took many parts of the curriculum from facing history and ourselves. So from the other kids, they got the message they were worthless. From the adults, they got the message that they were to blame. How can we send a different message? Many of our students have been invited, along with others from other schools, to meet Alex. Taylor Middle School is just part of a small piece of an initiative across our county schools. So we're really happy to be a part of this. We're really happy that all of you are a part of this, that San Mateo County stepped up and, and screened the film for 4,000 students in the last two weeks. Uh, and that, that brings us to 20,000 students in the Bay Area, which is really wonderful. So. I wrote to Alex because he, his story spoke out to me more than any others. Yeah, I pretty much came out here because I wanted to meet you. You are a big inspiration to a lot of people, especially if you're people who have been bullied before, such as me. Thinking me that way, we are the generation to end
Like, so we have a principal's pledge, the thing that you signed. Yeah. Where do we want to put it? I don't want to put it behind my door because I think it needs no, to be No, it needs to be in the public. Right. What no. do you think? I'm almost thinking the entry. As a principal, we know about the code of silence that our adolescents have. And the code of silence is um, that they don't want to say anything because they don't want to get in trouble, number one, or they don't want to get, you know, bashed by their friends. We have a lot of work to still to do, but it's important that a whole school understands this. Okay, raise your hand if you're going to be an upstander. Yeah. 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 Character is what you do when no one is looking. That's really they that's get really They're getting this. <laughs> Something that really lasted about the movie was when I saw the story of Alex, and it really struck my heart. So this is my anti-bully poster. And starting a bully club um, in this school, it helps kids stand up for what they're scared of. It makes them have a voice. Could we hang up a flyer? Chess club. The chess club, you just enter and you join. <laughs> Other people there will understand what you're feeling, so you're not alone if you've been bullied. So just remember that you're never alone if you get bullied, because other people experience it, OK? Yeah. Just seeing an open heart to other kids can make a really big difference. From the time, the, um, the time of the clip, which was filmed in October, we've had expen uh, extensive follow-up uh, initiatives. At our school, we now have a common language of upstander and bystander. Uh, and it works with staff, students, and the community to get the message across that bullying is not tolerated at our school. We've had many, many messages on our daily school broadcasts. Uh, they're a TV broadcast. We have an anti-bullying club that is flourishing. It meets weekly during and after school. We have an active peer mediation program. And uh, we also have public service announcements that go out to the community and also to our elementary schools. But most importantly, the students have had the opportunity to talk to, uh, about these issues. And when an incident comes up, they feel safe to talk to somebody on campus. So it's gone to a deeper level at our school. It's not just about the posters. It's a fundamental shift in our culture and students' concerns and ideas are listened to. And many, many new student clubs are formed based on these expressed concerns. So with this proactive stance, our number of suspensions have decreased. The number of detentions are down and are replaced by peer mediations. And students are coming to staff and discussing issues that they feel are important and the kids feel supported. But we're not done. We hope to team up with Sojourn. We had a group of our, of our eighth graders go on a Sojourn trip last year and it was tremendously successful. We're hoping another group of eighth graders will go this coming year. And we want to create a school-wide effort to make our school a Sojourn school a school that's responsible for accepting all and reaching out to our out with efforts to the community. What are the barriers? Well, to be honest with you as a principal, keeping the issue alive and in the forefront is hard with the day-to-day -day issues that I face. Engaging parents and community members to be active participants in this process, we want all to be included. Uh, one thing I have to do is not respond to in crisis mode. I have to stand back, reflect a bit, see what our goals are, and then respond. And we need to continue to train staff to be consistent in the message, to listen and respond to all. And the kids are getting it. It's the adults that need to continue to be involved. And the process always needs to be refined. So Let's moving forward, Let's see, I think we need to wrap up, maybe oh, 30 I'm more sorry. seconds. Moving forward, we have a restorative justice program that we're putting in place, and we're continuing our leadership and peer mediation activities, and we're also going to be a so sojourn school. Thank you.
So you can see there's great work going on throughout San Mateo County. What we would like to do at this point is to give Dr. Joshi a couple of moments to sort of recap what he's heard and react to it, and then give you several minutes to answer questions. We're probably not going to be able to get to all the questions, but we want to give you a chance to ask several. So our microphone folks will be wandering around, so when we get to that point, please put your hand up and we'll recognize you. Dr. Joshi. Yes, yeah, so um, I, I really, I'm kind of speechless right now. <clears throat> I think this panel really captured a lot of um, important ideas for where things are going. Um, I loved your last comment, Dr. Uh, Martin. First of all, you're my hero <laughs> um, for the work you're doing in schools, um, as are the rest of you. I think all of this, all of these ideas, when you see them in place, for example, in the film, when you hear in the students' voices how they go from being informed. I love the paradigm of beyond the poster. I mean, you need posters, you need, you need a marketing campaign, but that is a means to an end. That's not an end unto itself. But when you walk onto um, a campus or if you walk into, say, San, San Mateo County General Hospital you, and you see the posters and the marketing, it, it, it often is a reflection of the culture. If kids walk onto a campus and they hear the conversations or they talk to kids who participated in this. It's very powerful. And um, I, I really, I, I think that we'd like to invite um, those of you who have some ideas to, uh, to share them with us or, or ask questions. Um, I wanted to share a couple things that I thought about as um, Mr. Steinberg and Miss Africa were talking about Sojourn to the Past and we're sort of talking about tolerance more generally and acceptance more generally and really having the um, having the opportunity to have the discussion. I think that's really where, in terms of education, um, as, a, you know, as a college and as a graduate student educator and now as a parent of, of children in the system, I see that that's really the trend now where rather than being strictly in a teaching mode, which is very teacher-centered, you're really moving more toward what's going to engage students, what's going to, at a developmental level where many of them don't know about the civil rights movement, how can you engage them? And you have found ways to do that. It's really powerful. Um, I think in terms of the work that, um, that Jay and um, Steve are doing at the county, um, I've been really privileged to be part of a partnership from Stanford with San Mateo County in terms of training, um, training specifically for child and adolescent mental health professionals and moving to, a, you know, from the concept of cultural competence and culturally competent care, which really came around in the 80s, and we're now moving to this concept of cultural engagement, culturally effective care, and the concept of cultural humility, which is the idea where you know every encounter is a cultural encounter. And as I said before, it's, it often may start with race and ethnicity, but it's usually way beyond that. We have to really be able to acknowledge that every encounter we have with a patient, for example, or a student is a cross-cultural encounter. And it has to do with how you were brought up and your kind of view of the world and the student or the family in front of you. And only through being kind of um, an ambassador and an anthropologist and keeping an openness, I mean, you might know something about that group of people or this group of students or these groups of folks who have these values. But at the end of it, you're really, it's a one-to-one -one encounter. I was um, very privileged to participate in the Santa Clara County um, Mental Health Board. Um, a couple of training um, invitations we had to, to view what happens with officers on the front line who get CIT training. Have any of you been CIT trained? Crisis intervention training. It's, it's very powerful. And in the, San, in the Santa Clara County model, there are actually, um, role plays that are happening in real time where you're interacting with the screen and you're acting with someone who is, it's a cross-cultural encounter and you may be encountering, you know, an, an Asian home or, or a Latino home or wherever it may be where language is the first barrier and you're coming as an officer. How are you going to invite them to have a conversation and not have them, you know, run out the back of the house? Uh, very powerful, and that whole idea of engagement in real time or through role play or through bearing witness to something that you might not otherwise know about because of your own upbringing and your own sort of professional surroundings, I think really helps to go from information to transformation, where you really just take the information 
to move to behavior change, which is, I think, what we're going to be doing in some of the um, networking activities after this. So should we invite some discussion? Actually, I think where we are at this point is we need to get out to lunch. So what we're going to do is um, we have this wonderful panel that I do want to thank again for the great ideas that they presented. <laughs> <laughs>